Kisselbach's triangle, one of the standard high yield topic among the 650 topics in ENT, it is some eighth or ninth most high yielding topic, epistaxis, which is not the branch of the external carotid artery in the Kisselbach's plexus, is the question to all of you. So, you should know that Kisselbach's plexus, little area. It has an anterior ethmoid, which is a branch of the internal carotid, superior labial artery, which is a branch of the facial, which is the branch of the facial is the branch of the external carotid artery. Then internal maxillary artery branches, greater palatine and sinopalatine, they constitute the kissel bags. So the only component in the vascular tree of the kissel bags which is not a external carotid artery branch is anterior ethmoid which is the branch of the internal carotid artery is what you have to clearly remember. Then what is Woodruff's plexus? Woodruff's is more posteriorly located and uh, it is the sphenopalatine artery which is a branch of internal maxillary artery and posterior ethmoid which is a branch of the internal carotid artery are the ones which constitute the Woodruff's plexus is what you have to basically remember. Now, central tendon of diaphragm, diaphragmatic openings is a one of the 650 high yield topic list mein aap jao, dek lo, bahut baar poochha gaya. So, very routine question. So, the INC opening, it is in the central tendon of the diaphragm typically at the level of the T8 and through that past the right phrenic nerve, IVC and lymphatics is what you have to emphatically remember. Now, talocalcaneo navicular joint is what type of joint is the examiner's question. Type of joints, synovial joints. If you don't know them or you are you missed a question on the type of the joint, you are not Dr. Murli Bharadva students. Such a standard bullshit question that you have to attack it in the tomorrow's exam, expect it in the exam and answer it and come out in the exam. That is what you should be doubly sure about. It is a ball and socket type of a joint is what I want to underscore to all of you. Yeah. So, shoulder joint, hip joint are like ball and socket. Elbow is like a hinge joint. Radio ulnar is a pivot joint. And uh, wrist between the radius and the carpals, radio carpal, and the knee are condyloid or ellipsoidal joint. And what is that horse riding saddle joint? It is the carpal thumbs and metacarpals, carpal metacarpal of the thumb and what is gliding between the carpals, the joint is example of gliding. Once more if you take the ankle, please don't forget once more, same ditto ditto question will repeat in the tomorrow's aims also. Talocalcaneo navicular is a synovial ball and socket type of a joint. Calcaneo cuboid is a synovial plane joint. Also, the talocalcaneal is what you need to remember. Once more, to summarize to you, the best example of a plane joint is between the carpals. You have a hinge joint which is at the level of the elbow. Radio ulnar is an example of pivot joint. And between the metacarpal and phalanx, you have a condyloid joint. Carpometacarpal is a saddle joint. And the shoulder is a ball and socket is all that you need to basically remember. Now, a very interesting image-based question in the AIMS November 2017 about the limbic system. You have been given a structure and in that the cingulate gyrus had been shown to you. What is this connected with is the examiner's question. 
it is connected with the orbitofrontal cortex. Now let us quickly look at the limbic system. What are the components of the limbic system, Doctor? So this area is anterior and dorsomedial thalamic nuclei. They are very important for our declarative memory. Some of the students preparing for NEET PG, oh my God, photographic memory they will have. They will scare you, you know. You are one such guy who don't even uh, remember who was your ninth class classmate. That guy remembers from uh, anatomy's finest detail also. You will think I am a relatively demented before that guy. Don't worry. Reading room is like a mental asylum doctor. You get all types of personality disorders, all types of anxiety, psychotic reactions. You will have that pleasure only another 2-3 months. So enjoy it. Right? Then septal nuclei is for the short term memory. Mammillary body is once more for the declarative memory which is affected in the corset, uh, Bernicke's encephalopathy. Amygdala, amygdala is the one which conditions for fear, which is very, very important. Hippocampus is for the acquisition of the new memories. And cerebellum is for the motor learning. You are able to drive a car because of the cerebellum. And striatum is the one associated with the procedural memory. So memory is divided into declarative memory, procedural memory, etc, etc. If you look at the limbic system, some components of the limbic system comes from the diencephalon, that is the thalamus. So anterior group of the thalamic nuclei, hypothalamus, mammillary body, are the components of the limbic system that are contributed by the diencephalon. There are cingulate gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus, and hippocampus, they are the ones which are contributed by the cerebrum, is what you have to basically remember. So, if you look at the orbitofrontal cortex, it is the one which is located underneath the cerebral hemisphere. It is this area which is most directly involved with our emotions, and there is a connection between the cingulate gyrus. And the orbitofrontal cortex, which constitutes your pepes circuit, is what you have to basically remember. Now, doctor, which paranasal sinus? Once more, in ENT, most high yield topic is paranasal sinuses. Water's view, different kinds of radiological views to look at the paranasal sinuses. Where will you use? For which sinus do you use? Favorite question. And paranasal sinuses, how do they grow? Which is the one which first undergoes the uh, uh, pneumatization? All these things you have to be doubly sure, right? So, AIMS November 2017 also reminds you to mark that if you are feeling little feeble about this topic, today only in that list of 625 topics, tick on... Uh, the paranasal sinuses anatomy and sinusitis in ENT and uh, quickly review the DNB question bank video and on the U Medico start playing quizzes on this topic until you get 8 by 10 score. So that should be your goal. So doctor, till the early adulthood, that is until the end of the puberty, the frontal sinus keeps on growing. That's what you need to remember. So, the frontal sinus, it does not invade the frontal bone. That is, secondary pneumatization doesn't occur until 6 months and 2 years postnatally. But it will keep on growing, pneumatization continues until the puberty is what need to be remembered. Now, Sphenoid sinus, what is the speciality of the sphenoid sinus? So basically, there is no primary pneumatization in this. Secondary pneumatization occurs 6 to 7 years into the pre sphenoid and later the basis sphenoid bones. That's what you need to remember. And it starts developing at 
fourth month of the intrauterine life, sphenoid. Maxillary, largest sinus of all, and it is the first to develop in the intrauterine life. Which perinatal sinus first to develop in intrauterine life? Very happy to see 243 online viewers. So, so happy. That's good. I want at least 1000 of you to join. So, 10th week of intrauterine life. And uh, the maxillary sinus typically uh, at the birth, initially it is filled with all the deciduous tooth gums. And uh, the teeth and maxillary sinus have a very close relation is what you need to fundamentally remember. So, that is a little story on the maxillary sinus.